you would have seen in the invitation to the conference that um, we, we want to use the conference and the aim is to explore the links between issues of industrialization, um, equality and employment. And in particular, explore the contribution of the manufacturing sector to addressing the fundamental challenges facing South Africa. Um, and and how, those, how the manufacturing sector can be, be part of the solution to job creation and equality. The aim of this conference is how do we take that agenda and how do we take it forward? How do we add to the debate and how do we contribute to what the policymakers are thinking about, what the academics are researching, and how do we use ideas to further um, take the, the, the progress of the country forward? Um, when we take the background of today's conference of, and, and tomorrow's conference, uh, and we look at the relations between South Africa and the EU, then this is very much based uh, on the um, Trade Development and Cooperation Agreement, the TDCA, which was established uh, very soon after, um, after democracy, after 94. Uh, it gradually emerged, and today it, I would say it underlines the debt uh, and the intensity of our bilateral relations, which have developed uh, into a full strategic partnership. A few minutes ago, somebody from the European Union came to and asked me if I was going to talk about industrial policy in the European Union. And I said, yes, I would love to if there was one. Um, <laughs> I mean, I saw his face and realized that he was a person in charge of industrial policy in the European <laughs> Union. <laughs> Sorry, I was speaking with a tongue in cheek, as they say. Okay, uh, what I want to discuss today is trying to look at South Africa from two perspectives, the Latin American one and the Asian one, and see what lessons can we learn and things like that. Um, the first point, which I, for me is the most important one, is that it's not only in Latin America we are unable to grow. If you look at the last 50 years, every single country in Latin America, there must be an exception, but every single one, has had at least a period, sometimes even two, of very rapid economic growth. But what we are completely unable to do in Latin America is to sustain that growth in time. That's the point. When Mexico was growing fast, like Thailand, roughly half of growth came from employment creation and half from productivity growth. Suddenly, the same in Thailand. Suddenly, output in Mexico rate of growth fell by half. And what happened with employment creation? Nothing. It accelerated. All was absorbed entirely by productivity growth. Although output growth, South Africa and Latin America, is roughly identical, the same, you tend to grow via productivity, we tend, to, we tend to grow via employment. While Asia tend to grow via both. Small difference. Imagine Latin America. Imagine you are in some position that had to do some, something about exchange rates. What exchange rate would you follow under this type of conditions? Huh? What interest rate are you going to follow? So surprise, surprise, every single Latin American central bank threw in the towel. Now we have totally flexible exchange rates with commodity prices that jump all over the, world, all over the place. And you can imagine the effect of that on manufacturing. Not only almost every currency in Latin America is massively overvalued, no, how, no matter how you look at it. But from Keynesian point of view, worse than overvaluation almost is uncertainty. We all know uh, that uh, since uh, the global financial crisis, South Africa's growth uh, has lagged uh, other emerging countries and uh, commodity exporters, aggravating uh, its structural problems of high unemployment and inequality. And the government has recently adopted the National Development Plan in order to address these challenges. Uh, yes, it's good to target 11 million jobs by 2030 and 7% of growth by 2030. Now, let me raise this employment story. It is true 
that in South Africa, our, imp our, our manufacturing trajectory has been labor saving, capital demanding, etc. If you compare us to Brazil, we've grown at the same rate manufacturing output as Brazil, but every year we've shed 1.5% of our manufacturing labor force, every year since 1988. Brazil has risen, its manufacturing labor force has risen by about the same quantity every year since 1988. If we had had the same labor demanding uh, um, uh, situation as Brazil in our manufacturing sector, we would have another million jobs. Now, there's many people working in private security at the moment in South Africa, almost as many as there are in the whole manufacturing labor force. We have more than a million people in private security, and that is mushroomed. Why has that happened? Well, many reasons, but it's very closely related to income distribution and the kind of things that the middle class uh, persons and businesses want to invest in. That's what they need, that's what they'll buy. That is a demand function. It's a function of demand, it's a function of income distribution. And it dictates where employment gets created and what gets supported. The, the key thing is if you grow your exports, if you grow your manufactured exports, the potential there is to grow your uh, non-tradable services sector where the real employment is, where the big numbers are created. So take China, for example. We have 100 million people, maybe 90 million people, sitting there doing, in manufacturing and export-led manufacturing. That's a significant number, but it's small compared to the number of Chinese that are building, that are in construction, that are in education, that are in the non-tradable services. Non-tradable services, people in non-tradable services, consume imports. And unless you've got the exports to pay for those imports, you can't have those jobs in the non-tradable sectors. So the first thing that I think isn't in here, which I think is enormously important when you compare across countries, there's nothing here about the structure of demand, and there's nothing here about income distribution. Now, it's very important that the East Asian countries whom we look to for manufacturing growth, their pattern of growth was one which was, they had a high level of egalitarian uh, income distribution, and that improved actually over time. We have a very inegalitarian income distribution, as does Latin America. And this puts us in a different category. Poor people consume a lot of manufacturers. Wealthier people, middle class people, don't. I think what we're not realizing is that actually our mining, our mining situation is very dire. And there are many sectors of manufacturing that service the mining sectors that are reconsidering whether South Africa is the right place for them to be. So it's not just that if we don't get our mining together, we won't get the expansion. I think we're in quite a critical situation. I was on a panel uh, yesterday in the other conference, and that's what some of these guys were saying, that you know, South Africa has been a good base from which to provide mining equipment because there's a big domestic market. But that domestic market is shrinking, it's not growing. And so then you start to ask yourself, well, is this the right place to be? And we might see when we talk about deindustrialization, we might see some of the more advanced sectors of our manufacturing moving out if we don't improve the mining. So there's both a plus if we do and there's a negative if we don't, and we should be, we should be aware of that. It's, it's been said that, the, broadly speaking, the middle income trap refers to the phenomenon of economies stagnating at middle income levels or the risk thereof. But it's also been said that it's a bit of a wishy-washy concept and it's quite hard to establish uh, how it is defined and how it is measured. And the way that you do so um, has a very strong impact on the countries that are classified as being in the trap or as being at risk. I believe uh, Professor Palma discussed about how in the UK, whenever you mention industrial policy, they kind of uh, put their head down. And I would say from a Chinese perspective, uh, it's a similar response, but not because they're not doing it. It's because they don't necessarily want to perhaps share the uh, ins and outs of certain industrial policies, which I hope you can understand because uh, given the nature of dispute settlements, uh, that could lead to possible legal action. Uh, the assets, uh, if you look on the left column, that, that China's financial system is very bank-centric and that other, other uh, financial sectors and markets have, have, have only been developed over time and vary on a kind of trial basis. And this is very much linked to 
Professor Powell's point this morning about financial liberalization, and, and a lot of some countries took it quite quickly in a big bang approach, and, but other countries, particularly in East Asia, took a much uh, more sequential approach. Now, the MIDP had some very clear objectives when it was initiated. The, the set were of objectives were basically to provide the market with high quality affordable vehicles, provide sustainable employment, and ensure that the industry did not lose what it had created through its various stages of uh, local content development, and that it would contribute to South Africa's uh, economic growth. The one thing about the MEP, which is different from the, from the MIDP, is that it's um, two things. The first is that it's more around technical support um, rather than actual you know, funding of, of financial support, which the MIDP centers around. So it was useful, I think, to look at an initiative which focuses on providing solutions and direct technical assistance and be able to compare the impact of that. Uh, I think it's been a very, very successful conference. Thank you all for attending and participating uh, in this way. Uh, and drive safely in South Africa and travel safely if you're going abroad. Thank you so much.